So quickly uh, moving on, you know, I call some of uh, our leaders as pioneers uh, because they are the one uh, who dreamt about the Atlee Innovation Foundation, drafted the vision, the proposal, all the way to getting the Atlee Innovation Mission grant. It is their wisdom and the hard work uh, that got us this grant. It is surely rightful to introduce them as pioneers here. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Kumar Janikram, um, a former registrar as well, Dr. S. Meenakshi Sundaram, Dr. S. Dr. Mohan Lal, uh, Professor Tyagarajan, uh, Dean of MIT campus. Um, these are some of the other professors that really worked on the proposals over the, the approval process and we, we are here. Without their dream, without their hard work, I, I don't think we'll be here. It's appropriate that we say them, we recognize you here. Yeah. Um, Soma is back. Time to move on to introduce another set of leaders that are supporting us in our journey. Our board of advisors are accomplished individuals in the field of business, education, investment, philanthropy and technology. They provide the strategic inputs, connect to their network and, and also inspire young innovators. How they rise to this is essentially a great inspiration for our student entrepreneurs. The first one is Soma. Soma has about 27 years of career at Microsoft Corporation and progressed all the way to become a SVP, a Senior Vice President of the Developer Division. If you are a technology company, you know that developers are the hotbed of innovation. You can build a platform, but if there is no one to build on top of this, solve problems, that platform is no use. And Soma headed that developer division. Under Soma's uh, leadership, the Microsoft Developer Division uh, supported over 6 million .NET developers over the world. And he was also the executive sponsor for uh, moving India to the product development phase. Microsoft set up its first global development center um, along with China and Israel here in India and in Hyderabad and Soma was the executive sponsor. Soma has been an angel investor for long and now is the managing director of Seattle-based Madrona Ventures. He is also alumni of our university right from the CEG campus and has honorary doctorate uh, from Anna University. The next one is VM uh, Murali Dharan. We like to call him uh, Mike Murali. Uh, he's a very renowned educationist and IT industry veteran. He's the CEO of Bhavan Cybertech Group. He's a former chairman of the trust board of 72 year old Ethiraj College for Women. And um, he's also involved in a lot of non-profit and non-government organization. One being alert NGO that really helps, you know, the golden hour responses, you know, during the trauma. He's an executive committee member of the Southern India Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He's a panel member on the Tamil Nadu Education Panel at FIKI, which is the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. He's a charter member of uh, Thai Chennai. He's mm -hmm. member of the Chennai Angels. He's also one more alumni of our university and received a distinguished alumni award from our alumni association. We are delighted to have you both as our advisors. So I request uh, Soma to launch this program. Soma, I request you to click the button on the screen. I don't know that I see a button. Okay. Yeah, we got it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Over to you, Soma. Th thanks, Kumar. Can you hear me? So good morning, everybody. Uh, Dr. M.K. Surapa, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Anna University, uh, Mr. Ramanan Ramanathan, the Director of Hotel Innovation Mission, uh, Mr. Nagarajan, Professor Saravanan, Dr. Kumar, uh, fellow advisors, other esteemed guests, mentors, partners, faculty, as well as the entire AIC Anna Incubator, Anna University Incubator team. Uh, first of all, congratulations on this launch. You know, this is something that I personally have been sort of dreaming about for uh, over 10 years now. And I've had conversations with various uh, VCs along the way, with various people in the university, trying to figure out, you know, hey, when does it make sense for Anna University to launch an incubator? And I'm so, so, so glad that we are there today. Uh, a lot of people, you know, from like, you know, the university, from uh, the industry, from the government have come together to make this happen. And a big salute to all of you. And for me, it's a great honor and pleasure to be able to participate in this virtual launch of the AIC Anna University Incubator today. 
and then be able to get a chance and an opportunity to be able to share uh, some of my perspectives and ideas with you all. So first I thought I'll take you all back in history a little bit and share with you some of my Microsoft journey. And for this, you'll have to come back, uh, go back in time to 1989, because that's when I had the opportunity to join Microsoft. And uh, at that time, I was a graduate student at the State University of New York at Buffalo, uh, midway through my PhD program. And I got a call, interview call from Microsoft. And to be honest with you, I can't tell you that like you know, Microsoft was a, a super duper exciting company back then. In fact, like the only thing that the company was known for back then, and I don't even know how many of you remember this, was what we in the universities used to call as a toy operating system in DOS, MS-DOS, which is this operating system from Microsoft. That was the only thing that Microsoft was known for. That was a relatively small company in some like you know place in Seattle. And so when I got the interview call, I said, like, hey, do I really want to take a week off from my semester here? And I'm working hard here. And I need to you know, think about my grades and my PhD qualifying exam and start my dissertation. Or do I go to Seattle? I should tell you that a little bit of laziness and the ability to see some of my friends in Seattle won me over. And I decided to make the trek to Seattle for the interview. And the interview was a fascinating experience in that. And that was the first company that I ever interviewed for in my life. So it wasn't like, you know, I had a lot of interviewing experience before. I go to Microsoft in the morning. The interview starts at 8.30. And then it goes on and on and on and on and on. And uh, before I realize it's evening 6.30, and I'm just about wrapping up with my final interviewer. Okay. It's been about like, you know, nine full hours of conversation where each conversation is not about like, you know, hey, let's talk a little bit. Let's get to know each other. It's like go to the whiteboard, you know, write a program, solve this problem, solve this puzzle, you know, talk about a project that you did last year, right? So it was all like a fairly technical and fairly uh, subject driven, but it was all fine. So at 6.30, I thought like, oh my God, it's now over. Let me relax kind of thing. And then I hear from Microsoft, hey, you know, some of the other team members want to take you out for dinner. I said, oh, okay. And we go to dinner, start off as a social event, but then quickly turned into like you know more solving more problems and more uh, solving puzzles kind of thing. It was 9:30 at night before I was done for the day. It was a long day, okay. And I was like you know, thinking about like you know, hey, I don't know if I'm going to get an offer, and if I get an offer, why would I take this? Because I'm doing my PhD and and, and coming from a, a middle class family in South India. At least back then, you were like you, know, you didn't want to finish anything half. You want you don't want to leave anything halfway through. And I was midway through my PhD program. So luckily I got an offer, you know, pretty soon from Microsoft and I was thinking about what do I do now? In hindsight, I can tell you that like, you know, hey, I was incredibly smart. I made the absolute right decision, but I can tell you back then it was a pretty tough decision making progress for me. And the thing that sort of won me over finally were the following two or three things. The first thing is the, the 12 people or so that I met during my interview, I thought if the company was symptomatic of the kind of people that I met during my interviews, then I better be in this environment because I thought each of them was incredibly sharp, very talented at what they were doing, very passionate about changing the world through software and just were incredible human beings. And I said like, you know, oh my God, if I can work with a group of people like this day in and day out, I have to only get better because I'm going to learn so much. So I really enjoyed uh, the set of people that I got a chance to interact with that day. And there was a huge plus for me as I was thinking about Microsoft. The second thing is, even back then, like you know, Bill Gates was the founder and CEO of Microsoft, had uh, had this interesting vision. His vision was simple: Hey, I want to put a computer on every desk in every home. Now you have to think back to uh, late eighties to understand why this was a compelling vision. Back then, access to computing was still restricted only to a few people around the world, people who had access to mainframes or data centers. In fact, I remember for, you know, studying in Ginty Engineering College, there was a IBM 360, you know, sort of a mainframe computer uh, somewhere in the computing center. And you'll have to go there and uh, do uh, what, what we call back then as punching cards to be able to input a program and then come back maybe 24 hours later or 48 hours later, depending on the traffic in the, in the computing center, to know whether the program even compiled, let alone know whether the program you know, is, is, uh, you know, was correct and ran successfully kind of thing, right? So that's the kind of computing that we grew up with. 
and being able to say that we are going to democratize computing so that every human being on this planet is going to have access to computing i thought it was such a powerful and broad vision that i wanted to be a part of so those two reasons are what finally won me over and i said i'm going to stop my phd halfway through uh, luckily anna university finally sort of you know took pity on me about 17 years later and said come over here we'll give you a 100 doc rate but that's a different story and then uh, and i joined microsoft and as, as people say like you know the rest is history i can honestly tell you that like you know when i joined microsoft i had no clue what the future of microsoft was going to be i knew there were some very talented people i knew there was an interesting and incredible vision but beyond that i really didn't know much about microsoft or what it where it could go fast forward to today microsoft continues to be one of the the top most technology companies in the world in fact depending on which day of the of the week or month you're looking at it's one of the top 3 most valued companies in terms of market cap around the world and it has gone through like what i call multiple platform shifts and has continued to emerge and it has had its ups and downs i'll be the first to tell you it wasn't always like you know uh, glorious there were some near death experiences along the way as well but like the company has survived has continued being in a technology technological leadership position today and it's been fascinating to be part of the journey and i should tell you like you know hey some of lot of it is luck a lot of it is being at the right place in the right time uh, but like nonetheless like you know, it has been a fabulous journey now mike there is not the only company that's done really really well in technology space you could argue like you know amazon is doing really well you could argue you know google is doing well you could argue facebook is doing well you could argue apple is doing well you could argue like you know hey flipkart is doing very well you could argue freshworks is doing well i can sort of go on and on about technology companies that are doing well at the same time you also have companies uh, and the one company that i would thought i'll sort of pick here no disrespect intended to that company is yahoo <clears throat> yahoo is a company that emerged as the internet darling during the mid 90s and the late 90s and even the early 2000s but then somewhere along the way they lost their direction they lost their sense and today like you still have some of the yahoo assets but that company is pretty much done and it sort of got subsumed by by aol and verizon and all that fun stuff but but so it, it sometimes like you know hey companies go through these uh, downtrend and like you know sometimes die in the process as well but there are enough technology companies that have done really really well and these technology companies only show what is possible and what is coming in the future you know the, the one thing about technology that like you know i'll be the first to tell you is like you know the the pace of innovation is hectic and the pace of innovation is only increasing every year that goes by If you look at the last say 40 years 50 years kind of thing there have been at least like you know a handful of what i call uh tectonic platform shifts you know you go back to the 60s and 70s it was all about mainframes you go to the 80s and sort of the early part of 90s it was all about pcs you go to the late 90s and 2000s it was all about the world wide web and if you look back at the last 10 years it's all been about like you know cloud computing on the one hand on the back end and mobile computing on the front end you know in some sense if you go back to microsoft's vision of putting a computer on every desk in every home that's a vision that we are still working on the world is working on you could argue that we have transitioned from a pc to uh, including mobile devices that started with laptops and now with uh, you know mobile phones and other kinds of mobile device iot devices but the net result is today i would say more than uh, 4 billion people in the world have got access to one computing device or the other Uh, at any point in time in their lives now the question is like you know, hey why is it only 4 billion why isn't it 8 billion or 9 billion or whatever the world's population is today so there is still room for us to continue driving adoption but the last 10 years has seen a tremendous amount of explosion on the front end with mobile computing and on the back end with cloud computing <clears throat> and if you and the other interesting thing to look at all of these different trends is uh, sometimes you know the same company has sort of weathered through multiple a uh, generations of platform transitions and has survived and thrived really well and sometimes you know some of these companies uh, fade away along the way right and uh, you can you can all sort of pick your favorite company and say like nah, hey did that survive did that succeed did that fail where did it fail and why did it fail kind of thing but to me each of these platform shift provides a tremendous opportunity both for existing companies to figure out how they can sort of navigate through the platform shift but even more importantly for the next generation entrepreneurs which is where like you know i'm excited about like you know being a part of today's event because i think this incubator is going to be uh, a hotbed of 
creating the next generation of entrepreneurs and the next generation of wonderful, large, successful companies uh, that serve both India as well as the rest of the world. Now, when you think about all these sort of you know, uh, platform shifts and you say, hey, it's nice to, uh, if you have a, uh, what should I say, a rear view mirror, it's easy to say, you know, hey, let's look back and figure out you know, what happened because hindsight is 2020. But then if I think about what is coming ahead, do I have a crystal ball any better than your crystal ball? Not clear to me. In fact, I'll tell you a mistake that I made. About five years ago, I was really, really excited about this next wave of platform shift. And I thought it was going to be virtual reality and augmented reality. The result, and I thought like, you know, hey, by the year 2020, VR and AR is going to like, you know, start taking off in a big way in the world. And guess what? I was completely wrong on that. 2020 is here now. I think you know, companies are still doing great work in VR and AR, but I can't tell you that VR and AR has started taking off in any meaningful way. The good news is I'm still optimistic that sometime in the next five years on the next seven years, this, this notion of augmented reality is going to play a meaningful role, particularly as it relates to client computing. Uh, and I hope I'm right, but it has moved out by seven years, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a world of time particularly when you're dealing with a startup and we are trying to get a company off the ground and figure out how you're going to be successful with your company, you can't afford to wait seven years for the market to show. So most startups that start off in the VR AR space have sort of given up and are doing something else now. But I think some of the larger companies, whether it is uh, Apple or whether it is uh, Amazon or whether it is Facebook or whether it is Google or whether it's Microsoft, they are continuing to do some fantastic cutting edge work that I think is going to show through in the next three to five to seven years. You know, some people will tell you that, like, you know, hey, in terms of what is next, it could be uh, quantum computing, right? That's a dream for, like, you know, how computing can be transformed uh, 10x or 100x or even, like, you know, orders of magnitude better than what is possible today with the fastest processors and clusters of fastest processors. Is it going to be quantum computing? If it is quantum computing, when is it going to come true? I can sort of, you know, pick a date out of my hat and tell you, you know, it could be, you know, 20, uh, 29. Right? I don't know whether that's true or false, but to me, like you know, we are constantly thinking for what is around the corner. And if you think about it in that context, right, here is a set of what I call uh, innovation areas that we at Medrana are focused on a lot. Now, let me tell you briefly, like you know, after spending 20, 27 years at Microsoft, I decided to leave Microsoft and I wanted to figure out like, you know, hey, what could I do that is going to take all of my experience, all of my uh, skill set, all of my knowledge that I've gained over the last 27 years, building and delivering products to billions of uh, people around the world, how can I use that experience and be able to work with the next generation entrepreneurs and help them build the next generation great companies around the world? That is what got me excited about saying like, hey, let me now uh, think about my second inning, so to speak, and be a venture capital guy and get a chance to work with like, you know, some of the best of the best entrepreneurs around the world. So when you're when you are when you are wearing that hat and thinking about innovation, you want to think about like you know, hey, where do you see the biggest opportunity for innovation? Where do you see uh, people uh, building you know great enterprise value? Where do you see people solving real problems for consumers and business users uh, that that they are facing day in and day out? And so we constantly think about like you know a set of core investment themes that guide our actions about where we want to uh, place our bets. Okay. And, and this slide sort of you know, tries to capture uh, capture our investment teams, or at least how we think about where innovation is going to happen. At the center of this, we strongly, strongly believe that intelligent applications is going to be one big area of innovation. Now, let me, let me uh, explain a little bit about what I mean when I say an intelligent application. Every application today has got access to data. The application is going to uh, look at the data, try to get a little smarter, provide a better service to customers, get more data, you know, get even more smarter, deliver a better service, and build a continuous learning system. So every application is going to have an inbuilt continuous learning system that uses machine learning or artificial intelligence you know, techniques, models, algorithms, and use the data that it has access to to constantly get better. In some sense, I would tell you that any application that is getting built today that is going to survive for any reasonable length of time, let alone be successful, by default has to be an intelligent application. 
if you don't if you're not building an intelligent application today chances are your application is not going to survive because everybody else has got a huge leg up over you in terms of being able to deliver a better service better capability of whatever it is that you are aspiring to do okay if you take a look at like you know business applications you know for the last 20 30 40 50 years there have been a number of business applications that automate the business workflows that help businesses run more effectively and more successfully but most of these business applications today are being delivered as software as a service having said that pretty much each and every one of them is either uh, being modified or being rewritten to become an intelligent application so we are strong believers in this and so any ai driven business applications particularly targeting you know enterprise use cases and vertical use cases we believe there is a, a huge amount of innovation waiting to happen there the second thing is like you know several of the speakers already mentioned we are living in a in a sort of a very interesting crazy tough time no matter how you look at it even 9 months ago if you had asked any of us would we have you know sort of predicted how the world would be operating 9 months from now uh, i think we would all have failed the test okay but the net result is as as people like to say wise people like to say human beings are one of the most adaptable uh, species in this world and like you know hey we got thrown covid 19 at us and we said okay we are going to figure out how to navigate through this in the most optimal in the best way now i don't want to like you know uh, minimize or under, understate the 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 pain that many many people you know hun thousands hundreds of thousands millions of people you know hundreds of millions of people around the world are going through uh, that's both the economic hit as well as a health related hit uh, so i don't want to minimize any of that but but the vast majority of the world is trying to figure out like hey how are we going to navigate through this and what does this mean to us how are we going to do our work how are we going to earn our living how are we going to manage our family how are we going to continue educating our kids how are we going to have a good balance in life so that we sort of you know take care of our mental health as much as we take care of our physical health both for ourselves as well as our family members as well as our, our friends uh, and that's something uh, that has seen a tremendous amount of acceleration only because like you know necessity is a, uh, is the mother of all invention so to speak kind of thing from a work perspective 9 months ago if you told me like you know hey we are going to do a virtual launch of the anna university incubator i would have laughed and said what are you talking about okay but today that is happening because the tools are there the technologies are there we figure out how to make it work and provide an experience that is probably not as good as it is you know if it is in a, in a in, in person experience but nonetheless it works and more importantly it is more inclusive because no matter where you are for me to be able to sit in seattle today and then be able to participate with a with a with a number of people you know in chennai i think it's awesome that you know technology has advanced this much to be able to enable us to do this so we think like you know the future of work and we've been talking about future of work for the last you know 5 years 10 years kind of thing but if you look at this uh, future of work think about like you know hey people being able to work rem remotely people needing to collaborate with each other even though they are not physically in the same location organizations and businesses having to attract the best people hire the best people manage them effectively and retain the best people and know that these people are going to be working remotely which means it really doesn't matter where they are sitting on a day to day basis okay and finally we are living in a world where digital first workflows is what is going to work in a in a work context right no longer you know physical workflows are going to work or even a combination of physical and digital workflows because there is no way we are going to be uh, at least today we are in a world where we are able to meet people whether it is to collaborate on engineering whether it is to collaborate on product development whether it is to collaborate on marketing or sales or even being able to talk to a customer it's all happening virtually so the future of work is a place where we think there's going to be a tremendous amount of innovation and acceleration and covid-19 has only provided a tailwind for all this innovation to happen here the third category in intelligent applications that we are personally we are, we are super excited about is what we call the intersection of innovation particularly when you bring together life sciences and chemical sciences and marry them with data science and computer science the kind of innovation that's going to happen at that intersection where you have access to data where you have access to machine learning and ai and you can bring in biosciences and chemical sciences together that you know intersection of innovation is just exploding now you can think about it in the context of diagnostics 
or in the context of therapeutics, no matter what you look at it in the healthcare space, there is just a tremendous amount of work happening. Let me just give you one small example. You know, there is a company called Twin Strand that we invested in the last year or so. And this is a company that says, hey, I'm going to apply a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of chemical science to the uh, human genome sequencing process. And then on the back end, I'm going to apply a bunch of you know, machine learning algorithms. And the net result is I'm going to give you a way to be able to detect anomalies that is 10,000 times, 10,000 times more effective than what is possible with state-of-the-art technology today. Now, imagine like, you know, people you hear from friends and family and uh, people in general that say like, you know, hey, uh, you know, somebody that I know had this particular disease or had this particular cancer, I only wish we had detected it early. If you can provide a 10,000x, you know, improvement in the ability to detect a single anomaly in your human uh, genome, think about like, you know, what is possible in terms of detection and then ultimately in terms of being able to cure and hopefully also create a vaccine in the process for that over a period of time. That's the kind of innovation that we are thinking about uh, when you look at like, you know, life sciences and computer science coming together. So these three areas of intelligent applications, we are extremely bullish on. The other thing that we are excited about is uh, software infrastructure. As more and more people are moving to cloud computing on the back end, you got uh, Microsoft, you got Amazon, you got uh, Google, you got Alibaba. These are some of the world's largest public cloud providers. But as more and more people live in a multi-cloud world, thinking about how do you have seamless management, security, you know, DevOps capabilities so that you can build in one place and then be able to run on any cloud, deploy on any cloud. How do you think about observability in a multi-cloud environment? How do you think about providing the right level of performance, scalability, uh, and reliability? There's a ton of work that needs to continue happening in the infrastructure space. And that's a space where we believe there is more work, more innovation that's waiting to happen in the coming years. The other thing that we've been talking about for almost 10, 10 plus years now is the notion of low code and no code platform and tools. It's, it's really all about saying, <clears throat> rather than having the power of creating something with a select few people in the world who are what I call sophisticated programmers, how do we enable more of the world to become makers? Particularly, we are living in a world where the millennial generation is growing up uh, with access to technology, being more savvy about technology, being comfortable with using technology. And all of these people are saying like, hey, why do I need to wait for somebody who knows C Sharp or like Java or some other programming language to come and tell, to come and do what I need to do? Why don't you give me the tools? I am not a programmer, but I know how to construct things. I know how to put together things. I, I know how to do things. So why don't I do it? And, and so there is a lot of work that's happening to enable people uh, both in a horizontal way as well as in vertical. And when I talk about vertical, I talk about like, you know, whether it's financial services or healthcare or manufacturing or agriculture or what have you. There is a lot of innovation that's happening for people to be able to deliver this low code, no code platform and tools to enable more makers in the world to be self-sufficient and be able to be productive and do what they need to do. Now, most everything that I talked about so far relates to uh, the business user or enterprise. So some of them apply to the consumer as well. But the one thing that is like, you know, as big as any of these innovations is what I call the digital transformation of consumer experiences. Trapping up the slide, basically I was saying like, you know, hey, for all the, all the innovation and the potential in the enterprise world, in the business world, there is an equal, if not bigger amount of transformation that's waiting to happen in terms of delivering what I call uh, digital consumer experiences. Whether you sit at home and you want to like, you know, uh, communicate and uh, collaborate with friends or you know work people. Uh, you want to be able to do it from your home. You want to be able to order food. You want to do that from your home. You want to be able to learn online whenever you want to. You can do that from home. You want to be able to order groceries or other kinds of things. You want to be able to do it from home. And and the current pandemic environment that we are in is only like you know sort of uh, underscored the need and the demand from consumers to be able to have what I call a, a, a complete spectrum of uh, digital experiences that the consumer can have whenever they want, wherever they want, and through whatever device they want access to. And the fact that in the last 10 years, mobile applications have taken off in a big way is enabling every consumer to be able to have both access to a, a phone device as well as to a class of applications that let them experience everything that they used to experience in a physical world 
in a more digital first and online world today. And, uh, and you look at across the breadth of all these technology areas that I'm talking about, there is only opportunities, more opportunities and more opportunities that I see. And then you overlay this with what the Anna University Incubator is talking about in terms of, hey, how do I go create a better society? How do I think about better healthcare? How do I think about, you know, Archana Stalin was just talking about, like, you know, she being a farmer and working with hundreds of farmers. What can we do to to overlay these technologies in the in the field of agriculture, what so you think about like you know sector by or in the financial world, right? You think about sector by sector, vertical by vertical. Think about all these technology trends and and go think about what is the problem, real problem that exists that you want to solve. And boom, you've got an idea, you've got a company that you can start. Uh, and and the other interesting thing is today the barrier to entry for somebody to go be an entrepreneur has never been as low as what it is today because of the availability of massive amounts of computing that's available to you at cost effective ways because like you know the worldwide internet connects people everywhere where you have access to your worldwide customer base right away there are incredible amount of infrastructure work that has happened over the last 20 30 years that makes it feasible and easy for you to be able to get a startup up and running and be able to like start dealing with customers right away you know one of the mentors was just talking about like you know hey customer deal i think mike was talking Mike Murley was talking about like you know customer delight. That's so critical, so critical because you want to have customers who tell you when they are happy and equally importantly tell you when they are not happy so that you can do a better job of delivering whatever you need to deliver kind of thing. So having a way to go access customers and get real-time feedback is going to be so important for you to build an iterative loop and, and scale your company. And one of the things that people ask me a lot is, uh, hey, as a venture capital guy, particularly as a venture capitalist that is in, that is uh, investing in companies almost from day one, when like, you know, mostly these companies don't have a product, they don't have customers, they don't have revenue, they may have an idea, they may have a PowerPoint, and they've got a founding team. In, in that situation, when you have to make an investment decision, the thing that is really tangible for you is the caliber of the founding team. And uh, we look for like, you know, hey, world-class team. And when I'm talking about world-class team, right? Everybody is great in their own capability. What you really want to do is make sure that people are passionate about the problem they are trying to solve, that it is a huge opportunity in terms of like, you know, the market size or what is potential for the, for the solution to go reach. And then you also want to think about like, you know, hey, is this a problem that is going to be, uh, that is going to look like a, a vitamin when you finish uh, building it? Or is it going to look like a painkiller? And the reason we use this vitamin versus painkiller is because if it is a vitamin or a vitamin, depending on how you pronounce it, right? People would say, hey, yeah, yeah, it is important, but like, you know, let me worry about taking it tomorrow because I got other priorities today. Whereas if it is a painkiller and I'm in pain, I need it now and I need it fast. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get access to the painkiller. So to me, like, you know, solving a real tangible problem that exists in customers' minds with a solution that is at least 10x better than what is possible, if not like you know 100x better than what is possible, is what is going to help you realize that huge opportunity. And if this is, if this is the team that you want to bet on because you believe, you are convinced that they're going to take you to the promised land, then we absolutely want to invest in that startup with that founding team. So these are sort of at a high level, the three things that I look for before I make an investment decision. <coughs> before I wrap up, there are two things I want to uh, talk about here. This is for the Anna, Anna University Incubator team. This is for the Anna University folks. This is for the government people who are all involved in setting this up. There are two things that I wish that like, you know, and, and this shouldn't be a surprise because in my last conversation with both Dr. Kumar and the, the vice chancellor, I brought these two things up as well. But given that I've got a broader audience now, I want to make sure that people had a chance to hear about these two things. The first thing is, I'm excited to see that the incubator is open not only for alumni, but also for current students and current faculty members. Okay, The thing that is important is you want to provide the right, right level of incentives, I should say, for current students to want to take advantage of the incubator. <coughs> the notion of saying, like, you know, hey, take a full semester of course load, and then, oh, by the way, also be part of the incubator where you can try to work at nights and during the weekends, Sounds great on paper, doesn't really work. Like, like you know, 
uh, I think it was Ram Kumar who said like, you know, hey, you really, it's a, being an entrepreneur is a seven by 24 by 365, which means like, you know, you need to give them enough time and so that they can give it, give uh, their entrepreneurial idea a best shot. That means like, you know, hey, maybe ask them to take a semester off where you give them course credits and do hold them accountable because you want them to make progress, uh, not necessarily whether it's going to be successful or a failure, but like, you know, you want them to do the right amount of, put in the right amount of effort and energy and give them credits for that so that they are incentivized to take time out from a semester and be part of this incubator, particularly for those people who are passionate about wanting to solve a problem. The second thing is, because these are students, you'll have to think about like, you know, hey, who owns the IP that gets built uh, as they go through the incubator? Uh, most countries or most universities, what they would say is the IP belongs to the university, but then the IP gets, you know, licensed back to the entrepreneur for a very nominal, you know, sort of equity stake. So think about what is the IP licensing program that you want to have in place so that that doesn't become a bottleneck or that doesn't become an issue or that doesn't become a friction point as students go through these incubators and come out and want to continue working on the idea that they develop here and go on to build companies. So those are two things that I would say, like, you know, the university should think about. Equally importantly, uh, you know, the university is putting in a lot of resources. The university is sort of, you know, giving a 10,000 square feet, you know, helping, like, you know, create the team, you know, putting all the faculty members, you know, <coughs> energy and effort into this. So the university should also get something back. And to me, like, you know, the best thing that could happen is because we have a robust IP licensing program and because these companies are going through the incubator, there has to be some kind of a equity structure that flows back into the Anna University endowment so that over a period of time, as we have great companies coming out of the incubator that go on to be successful, that some part of the proceeds do come back to the university so that the university can continue doing phenomenal things for future generations of students and entrepreneurs. So these are just a couple ideas that I wanted to uh, lay in front of you for you all to consider as we continue moving forward. In closing, I would say again, a huge congratulations. As I mentioned before, I've been personally dreaming of this day for at least 10 years, if not longer. I'm so glad we are here. So congratulations to everybody that made this happen. But more importantly, I'm sort of looking forward to an amazing set of entrepreneurs coming out of this incubator uh, in the coming months and years. <coughs> Some world-class innovation solving real problems that matter to people at large. And finally, uh, the next generation of successful large companies to have the stamp of saying like, hey, I got my start at the Anna University Incubator. And I think together we can all sort of you know, lean in